Hi! So today I want to talk about my favorite neuroscience slash philosophy slash psychology books that I have read the last year or reread the last year. So the first one I want to talk about is the book by Matthew Walker called Why We Sleep. And I personally really enjoyed this book because I worked in the sleep laboratory at the Donders Neuroscience Center in the Netherlands. And I was just really excited to see a book that talks about the importance of sleep, not only for your body, but also for your mind and your brain functioning. So the book first goes into that if we don't sleep enough, what kind of adverse health effects it has on our body and that actually our lifespan decreases significantly. So I think already from the first chapter, we can see why it's so important to sleep. But then he goes on by giving this really strong research as to the benefits of sleep. So for example, sleep can increase your memory or your memory retention is better to say. So when we don't sleep, actually, our short term memories that we've created during the day usually are not well transferred to our long term memory. So one really good example is when we drink a lot, this not only has adverse effects on our body, but also on our sleep. And that's why sometimes we see that when people drink a lot, that they forget everything they did during the night that they drank. And he also goes into how an increase in sleep or a better sleeping pattern can actually help with creativity. So they showed these students different type of math problems and they didn't know how to solve it. But after they slept, they were able to solve these problems or if they didn't sleep, they weren't able to solve these problems. And personally, I, I was just really excited to see that the importance of sleep is finally recognized within wider pop culture, especially because we've seen these kind of hustle culture videos all the time of people that wake up at crazy early hours in the morning, 6 a.m., 5 a.m., 4 a.m. even. Um, and they then establish that they're super productive by doing this. And I do believe that these people are probably really productive by doing this. But for the general population, this is just not a good idea because you will get a decrease in your sleep. And this decrease in sleep leads to all these adverse effects that Matthew Walker talks about. So I would really recommend to um, read this book if you're also interested in sleep or um, if you're interested in the science of sleep, but also if you're just interested in how to optimize your sleeping pattern, it, I think it's a really good book to start with. So the second book I want to talk about is the book by Viktor Frankl and it's called The Man's Search for Meaning. And it's, I think, one of the books I reread almost every two years or so, uh, because every time you read it, you discover something new or something profound that's really important for your life at the moment. So the book is written by Viktor Frankl, who is this Nazi camp survivor or this concentration camp survivor in Germany. And he survived while surviving this camp. He thought about the difference, what makes people want to live and survive the camp or what makes people want to give up. And that's kind of the start of or his premises for logotherapy, which is this really common therapy method even nowadays in psychology towards searching for your own individual sense of meaning in your life. So in the book, he kind of has these three messages, which I will go over real quick. So his first message is kind of that in order to survive, and in his case, that was the concentration camp, one needs to surrender or accept one's own death. And I think this is kind of in the line of stoicism, where you really come eye to eye with your own death and by doing that you can kind of accept it and move on in that sense and I think especially for him during that time this is of course or was of course extremely important because he saw so much death all around him and in order to 
be able to survive what he did. He really had to come eye to eye with his own imminent death perhaps and even that of his friends and the world and all that surrounding him. And I think for us nowadays this is quite a bit easier perhaps to imagine because the world has been changing so much lately and I think to accept death as not a friend but perhaps something that's just always present you can come more in terms and grips with also life so I think this is a really nice message that he said in his book and afterwards he goes on to that one's goal in life is to search for one's own meaning so he doesn't really believe in the traditional sense anymore that God has bestowed a meaning upon us or that the outside world determines what our meaning is but he says it's an active job of men to search for their own meaning in their lives and this can also change so for example if you're right now a student Perhaps the meaning that you find right now is just learning, going to school, finding friends, etc, etc. But perhaps when you grow up a little bit and maybe you become a mother or a father, then the meaning of your life will change. It will become taking care of your children or being the best parent this child might have. And in such a way, it's really an active job for humans to keep searching for our own meaning and our own reason for existence because the world is not gonna give it to us it's for us to decide and to think about and he goes on to explain that people that don't actively think about this will go on to kind of get this sense of hopelessness or this sense of no direction and I think in the 21st century, this is becoming more and more important because we kind of see that the world is changing so fast around us that it's sometimes hard to really understand what is my meaning and what am I doing in this world right now. So I think reading this book would be really beneficial if you're struggling with something like that at the moment. And the third thing he talks about a lot is fear and how actually by coming eye to eye with our real fears we can kind of get rid of them so a good example i think is for example if you're really afraid of stuttering when you're presenting sometimes the fear is not even for the presenting or the people around you but it's actually a fear of the strut stuttering itself so you're afraid you will stutter and thus you will stutter and by just coming eye to eye with the fact that you sometimes stutter and just accepting this the stuttering can go away that's kind of the idea he goes into and i think this is really profound and this is a real interesting technique that is sometimes also used in psychology by kind of coming eye to eye with your fears so yeah i would really recommend to read this book it has changed my view a lot of more in a philosophical sense of what we're here to do on earth because um, I do sometimes struggle with meaning and what's the meaning of life and these kind of things and I think searching for this and thinking about this sometimes not all the time is really good and I think it's really profound the things he discusses in his book so the third book I want to talk about is by Oliver Sacks uh, the man who mistook his wife for a hat and I recently reread it because um, there has been a documentary about his life which came out I think in 2019 but I watched it last month or so so I decided to reread some of his books because he was kind of my inspiration of going into neuroscience and to go into the field of computational neuroscience in the end. So his book goes into these different types of neurological disorders and it starts with this really interesting example of this man who mistook his wife for a hat or who mistook the hat for his wife. And I think the interesting thing that Sex does by going over all his stories is he doesn't really describe his stories from a really clinical perspective, but he really tries to go into or look through the eyes of his patients. So he describes every 
disorder in a sense of how the patients view the world and how in a sense they also have a bigger picture of the world sometimes. And I think this is really nice because he kind of destroys the image of what normal brain functioning is or what a patient is. Because some of his patients really don't see themselves as patients. They really view the world just in a different manner than us and sometimes an even wider manner. So he shows how for some patients their disorder actually helps them to create art or to see life in a different way. And I think this is really nice. And even for me right now, I'm working with psychiatric data and we're really thinking about normal brain functioning and what's a normal brain versus an atypical brain. And I think reading his book, I kind of really need to keep reminding myself that what we think is normal is not necessarily what our brain says is normal or how we view the world, but more what society deems as normal. So yeah, I think if you are thinking of going into neuroscience or following this topic, or you find something like this interesting, then I think it's a really good book to start with. And I would also recommend to read all his other works because all of his books are written in this really easy, accessible style. So even if you're not familiar with neuroscience or psychology, I think everyone can read it and learn something from it. So yeah, hopefully you found some books or some inspiration for your next book to read. And if you have some recommendations for me as well as to what you really like to read within neuroscience, uh, philosophy, psychiatry, um, put them down below. I would love, I would love to read them and uh, yeah, see you next time. Bye.